Hey guys, it's Kayla. Welcome to my channel, or welcome back if you've watched some of my videos before. Today we're going to be doing a review, a book review. Haven't done one of these in a while. Um, but the book that we're going to be talking about is The Poppy War, which is the first book in a trilogy by the author R.F. Kuang. R.F. Kuang is the winner of the Outstanding Award for the Best New Author, as well as being nominated multiple other awards, um, including The Locust, Nebula, and World Fantasy. I was very excited to pick this book up, and for good reason. I did really like this book quite a bit. I gave it five stars, and I started watching interviews with R.F. Kuang after I finished it, and listening to her speak about this book made me love her even more, and it made me appreciate the story even more. So we're going to be talking about the summary of this book, as well as R.F. Kuang herself, and the influences that she drew from in order to craft this story. So in the society that our main character Rin lives in, there have been two sets of wars called the Poppy Wars, which has left numerous children orphaned, and the government has required families to take in these orphans, and so because of this, Rin is with a foster family that really doesn't want her. They use and abuse her, and at the beginning of this book, I believe she's 12 years old, she has been betrothed by her foster mother to a man that's like three times her age and Rin does not want to go through this marriage. She doesn't want to just have children and, and live this life where she's stuck at home like under the influence of this man that's so much older than her. It's just not the life she's envisioned for herself so she decides that she's going to study for this test called the Kudju and this test is very difficult. People study their entire lives for it and she wants to get into Synagogue which is the most prestigious military academy and if you get the highest marks on your test you are able to go tuition free. She ends up passing the test and going to Synagard and that is where the first part of our story takes place. Once at the academy Rin finally has agency over her own life and she doesn't want to give that up. She is power hungry, she's very ambitious, and she constantly is seeking acceptance. Rin needs validation for her hard work from her professors and, and it's understandable. She hasn't really had anybody there for her for her entire life. She's kind of been on her own and this is her first opportunity to get out of this small town that she's from. Um, and and Sinegard is not easy for her. She's dark-skinned in a society where light-skinned is the accepted beauty standard. She's got an accent. She is poor and everybody else that she's around is, you know, from elite families that have been in power and studying for their entire lives and it, it's not easy for her at Synagard either. So the first part of this book, it's broken up into three parts, and the first part of this book definitely reads more like a young adult fantasy book um, because Rin is a young adult and so are the other characters that she interacts with um, and she's at a school. And so I do think the first part of this book versus parts two and three of this book is a vast difference in the tone and in the writing. Um, and I do think it makes sense because the latter half of this book does take place during like wars, fighting and stuff like that. And so the stark difference between how the character acts within a school setting while she's just learning about war abstractly and competing with just her students versus how war feels in real life while she's living it and the stark contrast between what she envisioned in her mind versus what is actually the reality of, of war. I personally don't mind the difference between the first part and then the second and the third parts. I felt like it made sense. That being said, the latter half of this book is very dark, like grim dark, very violent in pretty I mean, and it's pretty detailed, so if that's something that is an issue for you, if you cannot read about gory violence, this probably isn't the book for you, because it is stomach turning. It is very difficult to read at times, but there's a reason for it. It is not just violence for the sake of violence, and we will be getting to that shortly. So the writing style of this book is something that I've seen criticized, and it is very simple writing. It, this is not going to be flower. This is very straightforward and to the point. And I've seen some people say that the writing style is what makes them consider this a young adult novel as opposed to an adult. And I ended up watching a video from Jesse at Bowties and Books, and they said something that really stuck with me when I finished the video. Um, but the elevated writing and flowery writing is not something that is required for a book to be considered adult fantasy. And I think that's so true. I feel like so many people will read a book and they just 
drop it down into the young adult category based on the writing style, which I don't think is very fair. Not all adults want to read really flowery writing, and I think this story stands up on its own with a simple writing style. There's also quite a bit of dark humor in this, and one of the interviews that I listened to with RF Kuang, she discusses how, like, the generations, the younger generations now, the millennials and the Zoomers, um, deal with their situation in the world with dark humor through memes, through Tumblr, through Reddit, um, and that's how we get by. And that's sort of what she brought to this book. Like, people are dealing with some really hard times and just kind of making inappropriate dark jokes about it, you know? Um, and it's so... <laughs> And she, it, it, it works for me. I, I think it works. I understand between how dark this book is and then the juxtaposition of the humor and the school, I just feel like, I just personally found that everything was working for me in this book. I do think that Rin is maybe not quite likable. I think she is, I think she's an empathetic character in the beginning, like you want to take care of her, you feel for her, you're rooting for her, and I do think things change throughout the series because characters grow and change as things happen to them, and I do think she gets less likable as the story goes on, but not uninteresting. That's the difference. I do, I still think she's an interesting character even though I start to like her less. Okay, so here's what really took me over as far as my level of enjoyment of this book. Um, I, when I finished this, I really, really liked it. And then I went and watched the interview of RF Kuang on Daniel Green's channel, and it really made me think more about the intentions that she had when she set out to write this book. If you don't know, RF Kuang has a master's degree in Chinese studies from Cambridge and is pursuing a master's in contemporary Chinese studies from Oxford. So she knows quite a bit about Chinese history. She's a Chinese American. Her father immigrated from China to America. Um, and I believe she was, I think, she, I believe I read that she came to America in the year 2000. She translates science fiction from Chinese to English. It's, it's a whole thing. She knows her stuff, okay? And so during a gap year in college, she went back to China um, with the intention of writing a biography uh, for her family in China. Um, and once she started talking and learning from her grandparents and aunts, uncles, whatever, she started learning more about Chinese history that she, that she didn't really realize and things that impacted her family within the last hundred years, all of the things that have happened to China in the last hundred years or so, um, and the changes that it has undergone. She realized that interviewing people about these traumatic events could be really difficult and, and bring up feelings that they don't want to deal with. So instead of writing a biography, she decided to write these experiences, but through a fantasy lens. So for example, when you learn about World War II in school, oftentimes you're focused on Europe and where things that are happening in Germany, but you don't really learn about what's going on with China and its proximity to Japan and the things that are happening during the Second Sino-Japanese War, which is going on during that time period. They believe I read that it's called the Lost Holocaust. There's really horrible things that were happening in China that people aren't learning about. RF Kuang drew from this history. There's very specific events, and this is a plot point, I mean, you know that it is a war that happens in this book, it's called the Poppy War, but one of the hardest scenes to read is based on a true event called the Nanking Massacre, or the Rape of Nanking. I don't think I've ever read anything that difficult in my entire life. Like, it is that uncomfortable, that stomach turning, it's very graphic. And the reason I say it is not gratuitous violence is because lots of the th things that she writes are things that she has pulled from interviews with people that survived this massacre that killed 300,000 of 600,000 people. The instances that she pulls are not just specifically from this period. She takes things from different parts of Chinese culture and kind of weaves it together to, to, to create a storyline, essentially. Um, there's influences of the rise to power of Mao Zedong. The kaju is based on the Chinese national exam called the Gaokao. The magic system in this is shamanism, which is, you know, based in Chinese culture and, and other cultures, I believe, as well. But um, it is, it, it, throughout Chinese history, um, something that is prevalent. There is a use of opium and opioids to get in touch with a higher power. Um, but then there's also 
dealing with addiction of opioids as well um, because they're very prevalent and people are using them to gain powers and so there's there's drug addiction that is discussed in this book and people go through all kinds of things that go along with that. The opium wars in China are different from the reasons of the poppy wars in the poppy war, um, but opium is derived from the poppy seed, poppy is, you get it, okay? There's, there's some parallels to be drawn there. Um, and poppies and opium are prevalent throughout this book. One of the themes, questions throughout this book that I feel like you, you experience is what is an enemy willing to do if they don't view you as human? And that's sort of what's going on in this book. It, it plays on that a lot between the two different warring countries. I know that like knowing the history of China maybe doesn't change your opinion about this book if you didn't like it, but if you haven't read it yet, or you have read it and you didn't know about these things, I encourage you to go read about Chinese history and I'll leave some links to things that I watched in the description box below because I do think that having this type of fantasy story that pushes you to learn more about the other cultures is, I mean, I'm reading something that I like while learning about something that I didn't know, you know? Um, I just, I just feel like this is such a smart book. So even though the writing style is very simple, the, the plot is complex. So that is the Poppy War in, maybe not a nutshell, but like, something like a little bigger than a nutshell? Like a, I don't know, a wooden bowl? The Poppy War? I don't, I don't know, this is stupid. Why am I making analogies? I just think this is such a smart book. I really, really enjoyed it. I've already read half of The Dragon Republic, and I'm very excited for Burning God in November. So if you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment if you've read this book, if you liked it, if you didn't, who, who was your favorite character? Tell me the things that you liked about it. Tell me the things that you didn't like about it. Anything, all the things. So thank you guys for watching, stay tuned, and look more to come.